I'd first of all like to say it's actually a real honour to be awarded the Gus McKenzie Medal this year, um, named after two very distinguished scientists. And I must say, if I achieve half of what Professor Gus and um, Professor McKenzie have achieved in their careers, I would be one very, very contented scientist. Okay, so the title of my talk today is um, Immunity to Malaria, a Global Perspective. Now I've been working in malaria for just over 10 years now and during that time we've seen a real shift in the direction of um, research. We've gone from an, uh, a time of thinking about malaria control to really striving towards malaria elimination and eradication. And this was really driven um, a lot by these two people here, Bill and Melinda Gates. And in Seattle in October 2007 at a malaria forum, they really challenged the malaria community to really strive towards actually eliminating and eradicating this devastating disease. So what we've seen over the past 10 years is some very sufficient gains in malaria. Many countries have seen a, a staggering 50% reduction in malaria cases. We've also seen a 42% reduction in the global um, mortality burden attributed to malaria. Now this is largely attributed to bed nets, insecticides, and also access to drugs, in particular the very potent drug artemisinin, which is now the current first line treatment for malaria. However, despite these recent gains, malaria is still a huge public health problem. Um, there's about three billion people at risk predominantly in South America, Africa, and the Asia Pacific. There are around a quarter of a billion clinical attacks a year, and about one million deaths, predominantly in young children. Unfortunately, our recent gains in malaria control and elimination are now under threat. And this is predominantly due to the, to the um, resistance to both insecticides and drugs. And unfortunately, unlike other infectious diseases which have vaccines, there's currently no malaria vaccine to aid long-term malaria control and elimination. So really what we need to do as a malaria community is to focus on a couple of things. One is to develop new interventions, and also we must also preserve the in interventions we currently have, in particular anti-malarial drugs. And hopefully in my presentation today, I'm going to um, show you how understanding global immunity to malaria is really key in these two activities. Okay, so no malaria talk is complete without a life cycle. So essentially the malaria infection starts when a mosquito injects these infectious sporozoites into the bloodstream. These then travel into the liver where they um, develop into merozoites. These then enter um, the, the blood and a single merozoite will enter a red blood cell where it will then grow and then multiply, releasing around 24 other merozoites. These then in turn go on and infect further red blood cells. So what we see is essentially a massive replication of these parasites in the bloodstream. And these very high parasite densities leads to um, um, clinical symptoms such as fever, anemia, but also more severe con um, things like cerebral complications. Now, people that live in malaria endemic areas eventually build up naturally acquired immunity to malaria. And this is predominantly against the blood stage of infection. So essentially, immunity dampens down your parasitemia, so it stops those high parasite densities from forming and giving clinical disease. Now, how does this translate when we start looking at malaria in populations? So if you see this graph on the right-hand side, we've got the disease burden by age. And what we can see here is it's predominantly very, very young children which experience the highest burden of malaria. But as these children have repeated infections, they start developing more and more immunity. And this is why we then see the burden of disease starting to decrease in children because they're acquiring immunity. Another key risk group is pregnant women, demonstrated by here in the green line. And the reason why pregnant women are more susceptible to malaria is that the malaria parasite produces a special protein called VAR2CSA, which enables the parasite to sequester into the, in the placenta at very, very high um, numbers. So how does malaria immunity vary globally? Well, in actual fact, we don't actually really know. So this map just shows the, kind of the, um, the malaria endemicity worldwide. Essentially, the lighter the colour, the more malaria there is. So it's kind of thought that the higher the transmission um, there is in an area, the more immunity a person has. But in reality, there's not actually a lot of evidence to, to support that. So really what we first did 
was we did some statistical studies. Is we went out into the literature and identified studies which had already um, looked at immunity in lots of different populations. And we were able to use statistical methods to essentially standardise immune responses um, across different populations. But I think the first thing to kind of note really in terms of the number of studies we find out there was that there was quite a lot of studies done in Africa, it was 28 studies, and that's not surprising given the high burden of disease. But then when we looked at Asia, only six studies have been performed in the whole of Asia. And considering this is where two billion of the people who are at risk of malaria live, that's actually quite astonishing. So like I said, we use these special statistical methods to um, standardise responses across populations. And what we were able to do was identify protective um, targets across different populations. While some immune responses varied in ge geographical areas, some were actually the same. So that by identifying the ones that were the same, we were able to identify vaccine targets. Because what you want to do when you vaccinate somebody is you want to know if you vaccinate someone in Africa, it's going to work. And you also want to know if you vaccinate someone in Asia, that vaccine is also going to work. Also as part of this research, we were also able to identify biomarkers of immunity, which would be very useful for use of serial surveillance, essentially kind of monitoring population changes in immunity with regards to transmission. Now we've already published um, one of these studies on one species of malaria, and we, had, we just submitted our other one on Vivax last week, and I want to congratulate Julia on that. And we're also st um, doing these studies on that pregnancy-specific molecule, VAR2 CSA, and they are ongoing. Now this pregnancy-specific molecule, VAR2 CSA, is also the focus of my laboratory and field studies. So really what we want to do here is investigate immunity to VAR2 CSA in pregnant women to help inform the development of pregnancy-specific vaccines against malaria. So where are our research activities? So our predominant activities is based with our partner, the Chocolo Malaria Research Unit, which is based up on the um, Thai-Myanmar border. Now the SMRU has sent up, set up numerous antenatal clinics that serve um, Burmese refugees that have come into Thailand. So we have a very good, good close working relationship with them. We've also done studies in Papua New Guinea in collaboration with the PNGIMR. And later this year, we also hope to go into other study sites um, in Papua New Guinea under the Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies program, which Burnett has um, instigated in the past year or so. We also have collaborators in Africa as well, so we're able to do lots of comparisons between African populations and Asian populations. And over the next year or two, we're also um, identifying further collaborations, both in Brazil and also more studies in Asia, which is really important. So overall, what have our studies found? So our studies have basically shown that in multiple populations, um, immunity to VAR2 CS, CSA protects against placental malaria. It also protects the newborn infant from low birth weight and preterm birth. So really all this evidence together from all these multiple populations really does um, help support the development of VAR2 CSA as a vaccine candidate. Now one thing that's quite interesting in, in this work is we've also be, been able to show that protective immunity is transferred from the mother to the infant, which is great. That infant then therefore gets a healthy start in life if they're living in a malaria endemic area. But what I kind of think is quite interesting about this is does this mean that we could then vaccinate pregnant women to protect the infant? We already do that for a variety of other infectious diseases such as tetanus. We vaccinate the mother to protect the infant against tetanus. Why, why not have a similar approach with malaria? So really we're going to kind of keep doing these studies looking at maternal fetal transfer in multiple populations to answer this question. Okay, so now I'm going to switch tack a bit. We've, I've talked a bit about how immunity studies can um, inform developing new interventions such as vaccines. Now I'm going to talk about preserving current drugs. Now it was incredibly alarming back in 2009 when resistance to artemisinin was first reported in Western Cambodia. Now artemisinin is the current um, first line treatment for malaria and it currently treats 300 million people every year. So if we lose this drug we, uh, basically, we have nothing to treat all these people. So it's going to be incredibly devastating if resistance is, um, yeah, is confirmed. Uh, so essentially, um, there's lots of concern around, that, around this. We really want to know how far it's spread. So unfortunately, our fears have been confirmed, and this resistance has spread. 
So it spread from Western Cambodia, which is um, where it was first found, and it's now been found um, in Eastern Cambodia and Vietnam, and up at the Thai-Burmese border. And recently, it was also reported up at the um, Myanmar-China border. So this is incredibly devastating. But what we need to do now that we've kind of noted these pockets of resistance, we really need to do appropriate monitoring and surveillance for the spread of drug resistance. So how do we measure drug resistance in populations? Now, unfortunately, there's no validated um, genetic marker for resistance. So what we do is we, we basically see how long people take to clear parasites from their blood. So here is a graph um, from that original publication reporting resistance in Western Cambodia. So as we can see on the, the y-axis here, that's basically your, your parasite density, how many parasites you have in your blood. They're then treated at day zero and then they're followed for several hours after admission. So what we can see here in this graph is that people from Cambodia, represented here in the red and the purple, take much longer to clear their parasites than people who are from Thailand, represented here in the blue and the orange. So this kind of indicated that this could be potentially resistance emerging in this Cambodian population. However, we also know that immunity will influence your parasite clearance. Essentially, the more immunity you have, the faster you will clear your parasites. So when we see these observations here, that, that people from Cambodia take longer to clear their parasites, is that because there's more resistant parasites or that population is just less immune? Essentially, we don't know. So really what we want to know is, does immunity essentially confound our understanding of the spread of um, Artemis and resistance? So we're now really kind of tackling this question now as, um, as part of a multinational study called TRAC. And this TRAC study has recruited around 2,000 patients in 16 countries around Southeast Asia and Africa. So the, ma the majority of the study sites are around the, kind of the, the foci of resistance now so in Southeast Asia, but we've also gone further west into India and Bangladesh to see if resistance has spread there. We've also gone into Africa as well because it's really important to know whether drug resistance has spread into Africa given the high burden of disease. And so what we're doing now is we're doing lots of high throughput amino assays to, um, to look at the levels of immunity in these populations. Now, unfortunately, I'd love to tell you how far it spread, but I'm actually not allowed to. <laughs> so basically, the implications for um, kind of releasing where this isn't spread has a lot of implications in terms of control and policy. So unfortunately, we're only allowed to um, tell you the results when we're told so. But what I can tell you is that immunity does vary in between all these populations, and immunity does actually confound our assessment of emerging resistance. So really the next thing then is can we translate these observations into policy? Well currently WHO recommends that 71 countries should routinely monitor for emergence of resistance. So essentially if 71 countries are going to be doing this, we really need to incorporate some um, immunological parameters into the, those monitoring and surveillance efforts. Okay. So, briefly then, I've really kind of talked about how we're going to achieve malaria control, elimination and eradication. And really it's two things essential to that. Developing new interventions and preserving the current drugs. And hopefully I've given a, a brief overview about how understanding global immunity to malaria really does underpin these two activities. Now, I just kind of stand here as the face of the Malaria Infectious Disease Epidemiology Group, but I'd really like to thank all the people in my group who have actually done a lot of this work. Rosie, Karen, Ricardo, Alistair, Julia, Bridget and Catherine, and also other members um, that have previously been in my group, and also other people in the Malaria Programme who have been instrumental in our work. Now, when I first came to the Burnett Institute, the Malaria and Infectious Disease Epidemiology Group was just me. And I'd really like to thank um, James, Margaret, Paul, and Brendan for their support in um, helping me establish my independent career at Burnett. I'd also like to thank Julie Simpson at the University of Melbourne, too. Um, I'd also like to thank all the other kind of group heads in all three centres who've also been incredibly supportive in my three and a half years here and have been um, really nice and helpful. I'd also like to thank people who make my life easy. 
and that'll be Liz, <laughs> Andrea and Paul. And of course, everyone he here that kind of behind the scenes in public affairs, trust HR, IT, and so on. And also, I'd also really like to thank the board for their continuing contribution too. I finally thank people who make my work fun, which is everyone. I didn't want to list everyone, it'd be a very long um, presentation. Um, so basically everyone at Burnett um, Melbourne, but also everyone at Burnett Myanmar um, as well. So next week I go off to visit the Burnett Myanmar office for the first time and really kind of discuss with them some of their malaria control programs and basically um, provide some malaria training there too. And also I'd like to echo the um, thanks for the Burnett supporters and donors because somebody like myself who's starting off in their career, before you get the big money, you've got to get little bits of money from somewhere, and they typically come from the Burnett donors, so thank you. Finally, I want to thank all study participants and the field staff, because without them, our studies wouldn't be possible. Thanks, thank you.